Well, thank you uh, very much, and I am uh, ready to have this conversation. Um, I am a military surgeon, and um, uh, this photograph uh, of our group has become a familiar, it depicts a familiar scene for me and many uh, of my colleagues over the last 11 years, specifically with our hand side by side, uh, attempting to stop hemorrhage, sustain the beating heart of life uh, in those injured in combat. The um, following photograph is of the hospital, or the tents that comprise the hospital in which the, uh, in which the operating room uh, exists. So this is the hospital where the operating rooms existed uh, during my first deployments. And uh, the next photographs are of my operating room shoes midway through my first deployment uh, more than uh, seven years ago today. <clears throat> this morning, um, I would like to expose this audience to what I think is the strange paradox of war, or perhaps uh, an unexpected silver lining of an otherwise dark cloud of war. And that is the transformation uh, or advancement of medicine, surgery, and trauma care uh, through the expansion of knowledge uh, gained from treating uh, a burden of injury. And to do this, I want to this morning go over the intertwined nature of war, surgeons, and surgery, sort of our surgical heritage, if you will. And then I want to go over uh, the knowledge that has been gained in the area of combat casualty care and trauma surgery over the last 11 years. Um, of note to this audience, much of that knowledge has been gained in the city of San Antonio. <clears throat> this photograph, um, let me just say, to understand uh, the knowledge that has been gained over the last 11 years, it's important to put the, the prolonged nature and the longevity of the past 11 years of war into context of wars from previous century. And, and to start with, this, this photograph shows a, a picture of then uh, Surgeon General William Gorgas uh, and William and Charlie Mayo uh, reviewing a surgical tent facility uh, in World War I. And despite the near overwhelming toll on human life of World War I, the U.S. involvement and surgical experience during World War I was relatively brief at 21 months. In contrast, uh, our surgical experience in World War II was a little more prolonged, but still only 45 months. And this photograph is of James T. Priestley and Charles W. Mayo, both Mayo Clinic physicians who left Rochester during World War II to deploy to a surgical hospital in uh, the Pacific. Uh, the next photograph is of Michael DeBakey, who's the father of modern uh, cardiovascular surgery, uh, then as Colonel DeBakey deployed to the European theater of war um, in support of, of, of combat operations. And while there was a tremendous amount of medical knowledge and surgical knowledge uh, obtained during the Second World War, you can see that the time period, uh, the duration was still relatively compact uh, compared to the most recent wars. Now, our surgical experience in the Korean War was also uh, abbreviated at only 40 months. It was intense, but abbreviated. This uh, photograph of Charlie Med Company in 1952 shows Frank Spencer uh, second from the left of the screen. Uh, and Frank Spencer pioneered many of the vascular reconstruction techniques that we use today, along with the likes of Carl Hughes and other surgeons in Charlie Med Company. Also, uh, during, sec uh, during the Korean War, the life-saving advance of rapid rotary wing medical evacuation uh, uh, to U.S. service personnel was realized. This is depicted, uh, and, and any of you who are fans of the popular TV show MASH uh, recognize uh, this logo and, and, and have heard and seen stories of the, the value of rapid medical evacuation of the wounded. The Vietnam War and our surgical experience during that conflict was indeed expanded, 100 months. And, and a tremendous amount of knowledge uh, and medical advancement came from the Vietnam War, much of which came from Walter Reed Army Medical Center and three of the men here, Norman Rich, uh, and General Hutton, and uh, General Whalen uh, at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. 
Also during the Vietnam War, San Antonio's own uh, Dr. Basil Pruitt uh, gained a tremendous amount of knowledge in burn care and surgical intensive care, and he brought that knowledge back to Fort Sam Houston and the, uh, the Brook uh, Burn Center, as well as the Institute of Re Surgical Research, uh, where I work today. In contrast to the wars of the previous century, the wars that have occurred in response to the events of 9-11-2001 have been prolonged at 132 months now, consecutive. And I'm, I want to tell you as we talk about the, uh, the, the strange silver lining and the benefits that, the, of the war that part of the reason these have developed is the prolonged nature that we have surgeons have had the opportunity and scientists to study over a prolonged period of time. The burden of injury uh, resulting uh, from these wars in this 132 months includes uh, more than 50,000 U.S. service personnel uh, that have been injured and more than 6,000 that have lost their lives. As, as we consider now the advances that have occurred uh, from this burden of injury and the prolonged nature and the, and the purpose of studying, uh, as we consider that, I'd like to, first of all, before I tell you what some of these advances are, is to tell you how and why San Antonio was and is still uniquely positioned to be America's go-to medical city. Uh, this is a photograph of Wilford Hall Medical Center on Lackland Air Force Base. Um, and it was at this medical center that over decades, surgeons were prepared uh, to manage trauma and severe injury. Uh, and, and that preparation resulted in a cadre, a, a large group of surgeons, ready to respond to the surgical needs following 9-11-2001. Uh, a similarly well-prepared group of surgeons and medics came from Brook Army Medical Center. Um, and this photograph shows the expanded, now transformed San Antonio Military Medical Center uh, next to Fort Sam Houston, which includes to the left of the screen uh, the 250,000 square foot research institute that is the Battlefield Health and Trauma Research Institute and the Institute of Surgical Research where I work. Not far from, uh, on the same campus and not far from these buildings is this uh, Center for Intrepid which is the nation's premier extremity rehabilitation center. Now those military entities and others that I didn't mention uh, in San Antonio, including uh, Brook City Base for a long time um, and, uh, and others in the city, have combined, I think, very smartly over the last 10 years to generate knowledge which have resulted in these changes. And certainly the, the partners uh, that we have combined with here in San Antonio include UT Health Science Center, private industry such as KCI, uh, the UT uh, San Antonio, uh, something called the South Texas Regional Advisory Council, or STRAC, Biomed SA, um, and uh, Southwest Research Institute as well. Uh, and finally, then the National Trauma Institute, which many of you may not know is, in, is, is, is uh, headquartered here in San Antonio. All of these civilian entities have uh, collaborated smartly with, with the military entities that I described to make San Antonio uh, the military or the DOD's uh, go-to military medical cent uh, city. Now, the first uh, advance in uh, trauma care that I would like to talk and introduce you to is the smart use uh, of resuscitative fluids. And specifically, uh, I'm going to reference groundbreaking research that was done at the, uh, at the Institute of Surgical Research looking at the use of packed red blood cells on the left and plasma in equal ratio to resuscitate severely injured patients. Studies by uh, Holcomb and Spinella and Borgman from the Institute of Surgical Research really turned uh, a new page in resuscitation, demonstrating a survival advantage uh, with the use of a balanced resuscitation strategy uh, using these products instead of saline or lactated ringers following severe injury. Another study that came from the Institute of Surgical Research is an Air Force studied, uh, Air Force uh, led project looking at the medication tranexamic acid or TXA. 
Now this study, which is referred to as the Matters study, was done with our British colleagues. And, and I promise this will be the only data slide or graph that I show. The pictures get better after this. Um, this study importantly shows a survival advantage in patients who receive this medication as part of their resuscitation. Uh, and that survival advantage is shown in the dotted line, a higher survival, compared to patients who were severely injured that did not receive this study. And it's the results of the Matters study, which have really transformed now using just a basic medication of tranexamic acid, which by the way prevents the breakdown of clot and reduces inflammation in those who have been severely injured. It's the results of those studies now which have been put forth into clinical practice guidelines. A significant advance related to a device uh, is that of tourniquets. Um, so John Craig and others at the Institute of Surgical Research have invigorated, uh, commercially designed and applied tourniquets and shown that tourniquets such as the EMT or the CAT tourniquet uh, actually result in improved survival. Um, uh, on the battlefield. They stop otherwise fatal hemorrhage from extremities. This is an advance that came really from the Institute of Surgical Research. Another advance pertains to processes, specifically the large process of aeromedical evacuation. And since uh, 2001, the United States Air Force has flown over 35,000 uh, uh, air, air medical evacuation missions, uh, which includes evacuation of a small city of 80 some thousand patients, 15,000 of whom were critically injured, and 2,000, uh, roughly 2,000 now have been evacuated using the Air Force's CCAT teams or critical care air transport missions. This is the flying ICU and certainly uh, an advance in process now, the, I've saved the best for last, at least uh, for me. The, the last two advances, and the only the two that I'll have time for, relate to the surgical repair and approach to bleeding blood vessels, okay? Hemorrhage, resuscitation, and repair of blood vessels. And this next advance relates to the use of catheter-based or endovascular angiographic techniques to approach a complex injury pattern such as this. Unlike large incisions, which were required to resuscitate and stop hemorrhage in the, this scenario, angiographic techniques use catheters, uh, balloon catheters, sheaths, and covered stents to approach uh, this sort of a, a, a complex scenario to stop bleeding and resuscitate the patient. And those are shown here. This is an example of an angiographic or endovascular technique. Now the last surgical advance that I would like to highlight, again, I, this is my save the best for last, involved the use of temporary vascular shunts. And temporary vascular shunts shown here in use behind the left knee, so this is a vascular injury that has occurred in the femoral artery, these plastic hollow tubes are inserted into the blood vessels to allow preservation of the extremity beyond the injury until these plastic tubes can be removed at a more favorable time and the operation to repair the blood vessels performed. Now vascular shunts were not invented in this war, but their study, their expanded use, and their smart use has allowed surgeons to extend the window of limb salvage even to extreme situations such as this uh, left arm amputation shown as a radiograph uh, and then re-implantation of this arm by restoring blood flow using looped temporary vascular shunts um, uh, while the arm is now fixated back to the, the remainder of the body and the soft tissue is closed. So temporary vascular shunts are another uh, uh, advance in this war and I should say like and, and, and resulting in an outcome such as this and reattaching this arm. The endovascular capabilities and the temporary vascular shunts both have led to new innovation uh, uh, and new devices and inventions, some of which are being tested and developed here in San Antonio. Um, now, I think the ultimate translation of this to the civilian sector is what many of us look for, and certainly all of the advances that I have mentioned have been translated to the civilian press. Both the press uh, articles reporting on these advances in our country and others, uh, as well as peer-reviewed publications uh, in scientific journals. There's a paper on the New York Times and then a uh, scientific journal. And then even practice guidelines uh, that are used by our first responders, such as policemen, fire departments, uh, and EMS systems. So to conclude, 
as we look towards and we hope for a prolonged and peaceful interwar uh, period, we would be smart to garner uh, the lessons learned over the last 11 years. Uh, maximize the silver lining, if you will. To do this will require that the military does not drift from its commitment to comprehensive trauma care and combat casualty care research. Such a drift would be a drift in commitment uh, to the injured, uh, injured service personnel. So no drift in commitment. And finally, committing to this maximized silver lining will assure us that the peace dividend that we can achieve uh, can be measured not just in monetary terms, but in lives saved, both in the battlefields of today and of tomorrow, and of the streets, uh, highways, and communities of our civilian neighborhoods. So thank you very much for the opportunity to have a conversation with you.